Success isn't dependent on being exhausted, but it, it does require a shift in mindset and mentality that your level of depletion is not an indication of how dedicated you are. And I think many leaders who care greatly inadvertently use that as a measure of demonstrating how much they care, which means those kind of going back to what you, we were just talking about, then you've got these leaders who are mistaking caring for their people for carrying their people. Welcome to the Beyond Speaking podcast from Premier Speakers Bureau, featuring in-depth conversations with the world's most in-demand keynote speakers. I'm here with Sarah Ross, who in addition to having awesome shoes, which you can see here, much cooler <laughs> mine, although we're both kind of like that monotone shoe there. Um, uh, she is the founder and chief vitality officer of Brain Amped. Uh, she speaks on uh, leadership, on all different types of intelligence, uh, brain science. So, so we're talking about like emotional intelligence, yep. everything else, leaders, people are dealing with a lot of stress and anxiety right now. Um, uh, she's the author of Dear Work, which is not a Dear John letter. It's not actually breaking up with work. No. It's just, it's helping that relationship along. And she's spoken to companies like Wells Fargo, uh, Fidelity, U.S. Navy SEALs, um, and uh, just has a ton of experience and uh, is going to have, you know, a lot to share with us today. So Sarah, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate in. it. So what got you started? What what gave you this interest in brain science? I was that annoying kid who would always ask far, far too many questions. It, it always made my family uncomfortable in one way, and yet they always fostered it. And I think when I really start to think back, like, so, so it's been the way I've been my entire life. My husband tells me that my job title should totally be changed because my job title is chief vitality officer but he says that my job title should be uh professional eavesdropper people watcher <laughs> and he always thinks that this is going to offend me and i was like that is me like i am a, a people researcher and so i am genuinely intrigued in why people do what they do and why we do not do the things we know we should and that kind of fascination with people has has been a part of everything that i have always done hence why I eavesdrop on conversations and I love traveling for my work because it's like it's this people zoo, but it really is just this interest in people. And I'm also highly pragmatic. Like, so I I really argue theories and different things. So the scientist in me wants to know the science of things. And so when you understand why people do what they do, and I don't say this lightly, like truly, when you get to understand that, I think it does two things. It helps you understand other people better. Like it demystifies other people so that you can have a bit more empathy for them or you can connect with them differently. But I would say the other piece, which is like the me search of it, it, it allows you to understand why you're doing what you're doing. And instead of just beating yourself up or wondering why you don't have enough willpower or why you're not like other people, when you can be like, this is what my brain does. So if I understand that, I can put strategies in place that like work with the way the brain works. And most of the things we do often are great strategies, but they're implemented in a way that actually works the way against the way our brain's designed to work. Mm. And so I am like lazy. Like I want to know the best way, the easiest way to do something. And it turns out the science of it usually gives some good indications. Yeah. I nerd right out. But I thought <laughs> you give me you give me that chance. My family's like, don't get her talking about you start there. And now we're gonna talk about brain science the entire time because I geek out to it totally. No, I tell you, I mean, well, that's this huge question. I mean, like you read like Paul like two thousand years ago. He's like, Why do I do what I don't want to do? And why don't I do what I want to do? He's yes. like, it's like, why is this thing? So what's your insight? Well, how can you help solve that 2,000 plus year old question? Uh, I don't think there, that, okay, so this is, I keep trying to find this perfect tagline, like, like the speaker tagline, <laughs> and I cannot find it. And the reason I say that is because there is complexity to humans and there's nuance and there's, there is the deep beliefs and mindsets that we have that filter the way we look at things. There is the influence of the environment that is around us. There are those personality traits that make a difference there's so much to make human beings human beings that it's really hard to just distill down there isn't a one size fits all but what we know from learning more about brain science is that there are core things that are really true so the reality is our brain is designed to want to stay safe and comfortable 
And so we do those things that help us avoid hard things and help us do the things that feel comfortable, even when they aren't serving to us. Mm -hmm. So what might be the most comfortable thing to do when we're really busy as people doing work is to like keep working, try to get through all the inbox, answer everyone's question, because that's like the safe thing to do. But it actually isn't the serving thing to do. Like it isn't actually what serves us best. We end up overriding our need for rest and the priorities that we say are really important when our family is sitting there saying like, hey, you said you weren't going to work on vacation. It's like, I just need one more moment. But recognizing that allows us to understand it. But on the flip side of that, our brain's actually designed to thrive in a sense of challenge, like mm. to, to kind of look at the world through this lens of possibility. And so to recognize that it's this part that makes us courageous, like it's the part that makes us want to like extract meaning from our circumstances and and explore the world. And for me to understand, like, where did you come from? Why are you asking these questions? Like, why did you choose your gray shoes instead of some? <laughs> but like though that I think it all comes back to this piece of when we look at how to work with our brain best, this if there is a movement I can create, the movement will be like, huh, I wonder, like literally to get people to do that more. Um, when I got married, my like our wedding party did this roast of us. We were talking earlier about doing roasts. And I don't think that's what weddings are for, but that's a representation <laughs> of the type of friend that and family that I have. So yep. they do this roast of my husband and I, and they're like making fun of all the things that we do. And they came up with certain things that it was like, do we do that? And so they were sitting down and they were pretending my husband and I talk about everything. We just talk a lot. And we're sitting there and, and one of my friends is like, the person's talking, she goes, huh, I wonder. And everyone starts laughing and I'm like, who are they talking about? It's like, <laughs> that's you. Every time we talk, you say, huh, I wonder why. And then it goes on this tangent. So it, again, those are the things. If we can look through this lens of possibility and recognize when we are making decisions that are in service of what we want in the future versus what feels comfortable and safe right now, then we can balance those two things out. I don't know if that answers the 2000 year old <laughs> question because that is a huge bar to me, but I think that we have insights that we didn't have before that we can use from an empathetic perspective to understand better. And we're always farther ahead when we understand. So uh, it's, Having said it's incredibly complex, we'll yep. put we'll put you on the spot here for Luke. So on the other side of the camera, you can't see here is <laughs> Luke, our marketing dress, director, who's fantastic. But let's say you're getting saying, okay, Luke, saying you've got everything's incredibly complex. What's one step somebody can do to get out of their comfort zone, and what's one step they can move towards uh, acting more towards possibility? Oh, that is over there. <laughs> One's, okay, so let's go. What's one thing to get outside your comfort zone? Well, I think it is what's something that makes you feel nervous and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that might be something that, like, I always say, like, an easy thing. There are certain things that activate a sense of aliveness in us. And that's something that I am very passionate about, like, just fully living life and, and having those experiences. And we know that there are certain things that help us to do that more. So our connections with people, um, getting out and moving around, uh, finding times to rest and relax and finding ways to explore. For different people, different things are comfortable and uncomfortable. Some people, the comfortable thing for them to do is just to chill at home, Netflix binge, like they just, they don't want to go out, they don't want to do anything. For other people, that is torture to like sit and do nothing. So the person who loves to just kind of stay home, maybe it's to get out and go to an event or do something that you haven't done before. The person who's always, always doing something, maybe the most uncomfortable thing you can do is to not move for a moment, to slow down, to take, you know, the earphones out and put the phone away and just give a little bit of space to hang out with yourself and hear yourself a bit. Mm -hmm. So I really do think what's something that's outside of your natural way of working not a perfect uh not a single answer for everyone but i just think trying something different always ignites an ability to start asking questions that you didn't know were there so for question one was how do we get out of our comfort zone do something that just is uncomfortable what was the second question you um, me? so you're talking about seeing the world so not so much comfort but then moving towards possibility mm. like your brain's wired that direction 
So what's one step that Luke or anyone else watching or listening can do? But we like putting Luke under. He's he's probably like, I can go rope a steer or something like that. He's our he's our uh, one of our resident Texans. We got a lot of you guys here. Okay. Anyway, so uh, outside of rope. That would be my outside my comfort zone. Yeah. For the record. <laughs> he's like, I'm going to go do that. He didn't wear his spurs to work today. He does have spurs that came up, came up last week. Anyway. Luke, we're having fun. See, we're, t- we're just being, yeah. So, uh, Luke, I, our, our producer, Eric, isn't here today. So, Luke gets, okay. all, the, he okay. gets all the glory here today. So, anyway, uh, what's, what's one way that people, Luke or whoever, yeah. could move towards, like, take a step towards possibilities instead of comfort? I think, so, to me, when I think about possibility, I think, in essence, that is where I said a little bit before. That's the, like, huh, I wonder. Whatever you are doing, if, if you see something, you see a person, I always say one of the things you'll... We always experience people and we're like, what is wrong with them? Like, why would that person do like we people are I love people and people can drive me crazy. That's just the reality. And so that moment when you catch yourself jumping to judgment or you think that you are right on something, uh, which I'm just saying for a friend, because I don't always think that I am right. <laughs> Hopefully my family won't watch this because they're like, no, you think you're always right. Um <laughs> But this is where this comes back. So something, when you see somebody and they're doing something that confuses you, or you're like, like that's that goes against common sense. Common sense truly is just your common experience. And our common experience is what's comfortable. So when we see something that we don't understand, instead of judging it, instead of resisting it, instead of proving why it's wrong and we're right, truly, if you can just put the words in front of, huh, I wonder, it truly does force you to immediately think that there is more than one answer, mm-hmm. that there is a reason behind that. And this is just working with your brains. Like that is what our brains designed for. And so even if that person is doing something instead of what's wrong with them, like, huh, I wonder what's wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Now you're forced to think that maybe something else is going on. And really that's also how we spur empathy, which is, Yes, to feel those, but to also start to understand what may, might be going on from somebody else's perspective. So it's a small thing. You don't even have to agree with what they're doing. You just have to be willing to consider that there is more to that situation than what you see in that moment. And when you start from that, even if you were just thinking it, the conversation that you have starts to be a different conversation. The way you approach, like we've all had those experiences where we're frustrated with someone. You have many people that work. Uh, <laughs> there may be those situations where you're frustrated with someone and then you learn something. You learn something about their life, something that's going on, and you're like, well, if I had known that, that would have changed everything. And the reality is there's a reason why we say, you know, don't judge people. Like Everyone is, is facing a struggle that we can't see. So the moment that frustration kicks in, instead of immediately getting mad, it's the, huh, I wonder. And then that activates that part of your brain to actually be curious and ask. And the moment you ask, that's the opportunity to be in possibility. How can leaders, so I know you, you talk a lot to leaders. Yeah. How can leaders apply this sort of brain science and apply this sort of approach to others as mm-hmm. being successful leaders, whether it's, you know, like you've spoken to Wells Fargo, Fidelity, others. How can leaders apply that? Ask more questions. Ask more questions, <laughs> ask more questions. Like to really, I think one of the reasons, one of the reasons I wrote the book, Dear Work, Something Has to Change, was because there were just so many incredibly exhausted leaders. And the thing is, when you are tired, rarely do you say, I need to take a rest. What you most often say is, I can't do this. Like it, like fatigue actually causes us to question our capability. We confuse those two. And and so when you are in this situation where you're feeling tired and you feel like you have to be the one that has all the answers and has all the solutions and brings everyone forward, that's a really exhausting ask. And and in this world, I, I, you know, I study emotional intelligence in this world where we say you can't just show up and tell people what to do like you. That is not good leadership. Yeah. You have to understand people. You have to inspire people. You have to bring out the best in people. You have to see their strength. Like that is a tall order. And the problem is, or the challenge I think that leaders are facing is they think that they then have to have the answer. And that was hard pre-2020 
And then we had a global pandemic that changed the way we work and changed how we are working, changed where people are working. And there is no longer a blueprint of certainty. If there wasn't before, there really isn't now. So a leader cannot have every single answer. They just they just can't. And it's too heavy of a weight to carry. And at the end of the day, trying to have the answer to everything actually is disempowering to the people that they work with. And so when I say you need to ask questions, it's because stop trying to have the answer and figure things out. I've been asking the question of leaders and anyone, what are the qualities that come to mind when you think of the best people that you've worked with? And no one has ever said, and we collected over 30,000 like official data points on this. And no one has ever said the best people I've worked with are the people who have all the answers. Mm -hmm. Never. It is the people, it's how those leaders made me feel when I came with a question. And if leaders can recognize that, that they don't have to focus on having the answer, they the value is meeting people where they are and focusing on asking better questions. Everyone gets better through that. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if that helps answer the question, but it is that you you just have to be gathering more information versus just thinking you're the one who's going to disperse all of the wisdom. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, one of the other things like you were talking about in, um, in Dear Work mm. is there's sort of the two categories of people. You have the people who are like crazy stressed. They're still maybe accomplishing things, but it's like you're getting lower returns as a human. Yes. And then you have the other people. What are those two things that divide those two oh. people? This was my, the most disheartening part of the research that I did. Like I, so two things. I wanted the research to show that if you're exhausted, you can't be a good leader. Because then that builds a story with data points for me to go to organizations and say, you have to take care of yourself. Like you have to do that personal work of work. But it didn't show that. Mm. Some of the leaders who were assessed highest on the scale of emotional intelligence. So by their the people that reported to them, the colleagues they worked with, maybe the people or board that they reported to. So highest in those scores of emotional intelligence, there was a, a subset of those who also scored highest on rates of potential burnout. Mm. And that is a like that is a disheartening thing. And so the reason I say that is because those leaders because they are achieving great things and they're exhausted, they start to believe that they are achieving great things because they are exhausted. That they have to be in this survival mode. They have to be sacrificing things. There has to be a trade-off in order for you to be good at what you do. But then the part that I loved was, well, then there were these other leaders and it was a much smaller group. <laughs> it was under 20%, unfortunately, who were not only rated high from other people around them as being a good leader and making me feel good and driving results. So it wasn't just like somebody that you liked working with, but they also felt more energized. They were scored by their family as being more present. They were people who truly like were like, I put my phone away at night so that I can rest and recover. And it was like, so what's the difference between those? And what we can extract from that is exhaustion and excellence are not mutually exclusive. And if there is a message I can send home, it is that one. Success isn't dependent on being exhausted, but it it does require a shift in mindset and mentality that your level of depletion is not an indication of how dedicated you are. Mm -hmm. And I think many leaders who care greatly inadvertently use that as a measure of demonstrating how much they care, which means those kind of going back to what you we were just talking about, then you've got these leaders who are mistaking caring for their people for carrying their people. And that becomes a huge difference between those two groups. So the more you are activating that mindset of possibility, the more you are asking questions and recognizing the way to pull the best out in people is to empower people and to see how they learn and, and to build those solutions together, Versus those that everyone loves, but everyone counts on to like answer every email, no matter when it's sent, solve every problem, no matter how intense it is, make every sacrifice, no matter what the cost is. That creates that environment where leaders, no matter what they do, are going to be spinning their wheels in survival mode. So you can have all the strategies in the world, like 
people will say, we need, we our, our leaders are getting burnt out. We really just, we need a couple of strategies to get them out of it. And I'm like, great. <laughs> I can guarantee you are there. No one in the Navy is lacking in strategies to be effective performers. <laughs> they, they are not lacking in strategies. There is a miss or a gap between why it's so hard to apply those strategies in those difficult moments. And that is an underlying story, an underlying belief about what it means to be good at what we do. And so dear work is changing our relationship to work, but redefining what success looks like, not by lowering the bar, but expanding that metrics to say it's not just driving results. It's do we collectively lift people up? Um, my parents, I we were talking earlier, I was, I'm really blessed because I had just beautiful, amazing parents. And when I was growing up, um, I was a very competitive. I am still a competitive human being. Like we're walking in an airport and I'm like, I think I should be walking faster than that <laughs> that person because they're old and I should walk. Like, I will, I'm not going to drop them up. I'm going to just like walk seven. really fast. I'm one of those people. And I, this is such a random story, but I got kicked out of a basketball team or a basketball. Well, I actually got kicked off the basketball team because there was a jump ball when I was in high school. And for anybody who doesn't know, it's like when you both go for the ball at the same time. And I did go in quite aggressively and I have like long arms and I'm tall. So I had a good pull. And the person I was in this jump ball situation with was a little bit smaller than I was and quite light. And so they like took air and went across the court <laughs> and I got kicked out of that game. And then uh, my coach said that I was too competitive. And I went home and was devastated. Like, I really was. It, and I said to my parents, like, you know, this is what happened. And they were not cool with getting kicked off of anything. And I said, but they said I was too competitive and um, formative. Like, this is one of those formative moments. Um, my parents asked two questions. They said, was that the best version of you out there today? No. Did that version of you help your team? No. You don't have to be less of who you are. You do have to figure out how to make sure that you are the best version of you for your team. And those two questions have now been the basis of work that I do. So for individuals, like, is that your best you in that moment? And was that also what brought the best out in others? And from a leadership perspective, both of those answers have to be true. Both do, from a performance perspective, both of those have to be true. So if you're doing your very best and it's at the cost of people around you, we've called that high performance before. That is not high performance. There is a cost to that. But if you're a leader and it's like, hey, I'm bringing the best out in others, but there is a cost to me, that isn't okay either. We That's the redefinition of, of success that I think we really need to think about. It must be healthy and in service of just not just us, but collectively raising the level of the people around us in a healthy way as well. Now, do you have any examples? Uh, any you've worked with a lot of thousands yep. of people, of people who, uh, of those leaders who've gone from um, liked by their by their teams and successful results, but were burnt out, oh. to ones that were liked by their teams, successful outcomes, but have gone on to be less burned out, better, I don't know, balanced person, whatever the term would be. Um, yes, because I do a lot of coaching. So there is a lot of those examples. So I won't throw out names, but I'll, so perhaps this is the better if, if this helps in a way of answering it. One of the things that's, that's different for those who I call it the standout zone. And what I mean by standout sounds like you're the best. So I really should have thought that through differently because that isn't actually what I meant, but I will do that in the second. Yeah. Yeah. The, I meant like the standout zone really is that, that place where you're able to bring your best, most energized self. And it stands out because people notice it. It's like, that's when you're grounded in your values and you're doing that important work. Uh, and the survival zone is is where you feel consumed by demands that you're facing and you're in this mode of sacrifice and trade-offs. So those that seem to be able to work more consistently from their standout zone and are rated by the people that they work with as being great leaders and have not lost their foothold on success, like from a results perspective, because I think that is is a thing that's in our head that it's like, Yes, you're very nice, but you're not getting things done. And that, so I want to get that in there. That's part of the research. It's not that those people are never stressed out and tired and overwhelmed. It's that they recognize more quickly when they're headed or hanging out in the survival zone and they get out more quickly. Like they don't stay there as long. 
And most of the the leaders who who were kind of on that track of burnout, it's not like they were always there. They just didn't, they went through a time of intensity that pushed them into that mode of just like crisis mode, survival mode, and then they don't leave it. All of a sudden survival mode becomes their normal mode. So really the big difference is, can you be aware of it? And do you have an exit strategy out of it? And that, that kind of being more planful and as strategic with our energy as we are with our goals and our strategies at work, that really is the difference. And it's a process. It's a process. It's not a solution. There, No one ever gets that done because there are going to be different demands on us at times. So it's just in the ebbing and flowing of this, can we be more aware so we spend more time aligned with the values that are most important to us? living in a way that is meaningful and healthy for us. Uh, and that's really the the big difference. I don't know if that answers your yeah. question, yeah. but it's more of just to get out of the all or nothing. That it's like, there's great people and then there's there's exhausted people. It's like, no, we're all the same people. It's just which, are we more aware and where do we hang out the most? Mm -hmm. Awesome, great. Well, Sarah, thank you so You're much for, for sharing that. And uh, for those who are watching or listening, uh, you can learn more about Sarah at uh, premierspeakers.com. And uh, do you have a huh, I Wonder podcast yet? Because no, but I, be, I think that one should, should we, be on there. Do I have a tag lock? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, no there we go. And uh, so anyway, make sure to check that out and uh, rate, uh, review, and subscribe. So Sarah, thank you so much for coming out and being part of, of the uh, Beyond Speaking Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the Beyond Speaking Podcast. To learn more about today's guests, visit premierspeakers.com. Make sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen.